first of all, I will start with the very important path of Bhagavan teaching regarding Atma Visara, particularly the proper Atma Visara technique. Um, the term itself, self investigation, causing me confusion lately. According to the teaching, if it says we have to analyze the ego with the sharp mind. Not only that, even the term of investigation itself not compatible with abidance, with the ego or self. As you have been mentioning the famous uh, metaphorical story of rope and snake, every time when I hear from your teaching, it also implies that the necessary for examine carefully. So all these three things making me to think this, the idea of using our mind intensely to analyze the life force within or the ego or spooky, whatever we call. So I think that I need to intensely utilize my concentration to look into that. But this is in contrast to another core teaching of Bhavan to stay as at Atman Nista Paran. So Atman Nista Paranai Irkavanda. In this situation, we are not using our mind to analyze the ego. So in another way, we can say as Mano Laya, until it gets destroyed. So, and this is the preferred progressing stage of Bhagavan path. So could you please explain between these two contradictory statements, whether we have to use the mind or concentration to analyze very deep into the uh, soul, or just we have to stay with our ego and when we are staying, it will disappear and we will c get to know the real nature. Because most of uh, the teaching, we are talking not much detail about the technique and the e experience, what okay. we are feeling, Okay. we are expecting. So could you please explain, sir? Right. Um Firstly, I don't think um, analyze is the correct word to use in this context, because analyze implies an intellectual process, a, a reasoning process. This, this isn't an analysis in that sense. Um, if, you, if you see a, a snake, a rope, and you mistake it to be a snake, if you are asked to investigate it to see what it really is, how would you investigate it? You, the only way to investigate it is to look at it very carefully. And if you look at it carefully enough, you will see what it actually is, namely a rope. It is not a snake, it's just a rope. Likewise, uh, self-investigation, the way, only way to investigate ourselves is to look at ourselves very carefully to see what we actually are. Um, even to say technique, it's, it's not really a technique. If you want to see what something is, you have to look at it carefully. That, that, that's all the technique there is. So look, obviously we, we are not a physical object, so we can't look at ourselves carefully with our eyes, but we can only look at ourselves carefully with what Bhagavan sometimes refers to as the inner eye. Um, Manakkan. Hmm? Manakkan. Yes, yes, or ah Ahakan. In, um, in verse 43 of, um, of uh, I think it's 43 of, uh, uh, or maybe, 43 or 44 of uh, Aksharamlai, Tirumbi Aham, that means turning within, Dinam uh, Tane Dinam Ahakankan, see yourself uh, daily with the inner eye. So it's just a matter of looking within ourselves to see what we actually are. That's all the technique involved. This is not an analysis. The analysis stage is an earlier stage that is first. Before we can um, look at ourselves correctly, 
we first have to distinguish ourselves from what we seem to be. Now we seem to be a person. This person consists of uh, what are called five sheaths. That's a physical body, the life animating the body, the mind, the intellect, and the will. These five are collectively make up the person we seem to be. But none of these things are what we actually are. So we need to analyze our experience to see that we are none of these things. Because this physical body, we now experience this physical body as I. But we don't always experience this physical body as I. In dream, we experience some other, phys some other uh, body as I. So in this way, we analyze. This is called the process of neti neti. This is just the preliminary analysis to decide what we are not. Once we've, once we've understood that we are not any of these things, we are not this physical body, we're not this mind, we're not this intellect or any of these things, we are that I which identifies itself with all these things. So we are, we are trying to separate, uh, that by our analysis, we are trying to distinguish the seer from the seen. This is called Drik Drisya Viveka. The seer is ourself. Everything, all phenomena, including these five sheaths, are what is see, seen, what is perceived. So we are the perceiver, they are perceived. In self-investigation, we are to look at only the perceiver, not at anything that is perceived. In other words, we have to attend to the subject, not to any object. So the analysis is a preliminary stage. That is not the self-investigation. That is the neti neti stage, where we distinguish ourselves from all the things we are not. All these other things are an atma. We are alone our atma. So we, once, we once we recognize that we are not any object, we are only the subject, all we, then we can start the self-investigation. So what do we have to do? We just have to attend to ourselves. For some people, this <coughs> they find it. Some people find it difficult at first to grasp what it means to be self-attentive, because we are so accustomed to attending to objects. When we try to attend to a subject, we again trying to look for some object which we imagine to be the subject, but the subject is never an object. So we are just trying to attend to ourselves. That is to the basic awareness. Though our attention usually goes towards objects, towards things other than ourselves, we can attend to anything we are aware of. And the one thing we are always aware of is I. So though I am not an object, I can attend to myself. That is, we are always self-aware. We are always aware I am. But generally, because we are more interested in other things, we are always attending to things other than ourselves. So in, in self-investigation, what we're interested to know is who am I? So we want to, so our, we, we're trying to divert our interest away from other things back towards ourselves. So um, we, whereas normally we, we, we are always self-aware. There's never a moment when we are not self-aware. There's never a moment when we are not aware of ourselves as I am, but generally because of our interest in other things, we neglect our self-awareness. We attend to other things. So now we, instead of being negligently self-aware, we are trying to be attentively self-aware. Does that help to clarify? I, th that's part of my answer, but is, is it clear so yeah, far? I, I won't leave you for the first 40 minutes. I will ask more and more questions. No, no, but, but don't ask more yet, because I haven't yet finished, because you oh, asked okay. another thing. You asked about... Yeah. Uh, Atmanishta, that you, you felt that Atmanishta seems to be something different from, um, from uh, self-investigation. Um, <clears throat> when, wh what Atmanishta means is basically in simple English, it's just being as we actually are. Of course, we always are what we actually are, but when we rise as ego, we seem to become something else. So being Atmanishta means being without rising as ego. How can we be without rising as ego? The nature of ego is to rise 
we, that, that is, whenever we rise as ego, we, we are aware of things other than ourselves. So it's by, it's being aware of other things that we arise as ego. As Bhagavan says in verse 25 of um, Uruzunapadu, Urupatri undam, Urupatri nikkum, Urupatri undu mithongum. I said, this is the nature of ego. Grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes. And he ends that verse by saying, Urupatri payahande. That means formless phantom ego. So this ego is formless in the sense that it has no form of its own, but it cannot rise without grasping the form of a body as itself. And then through the, form, through the five senses, it's grasping all these other forms. So form means anything other than ego, any phenomena is a form. So it's by grasping form, by being aware of form. So since the nature of ego is to rise by grasping form, it will subside only by grasping itself, because it itself is formless. So when we turn our attention back towards ourself, as Bhagavan says in that same verse, Tedinal Otum Pidicum, that means when sought, it takes flight. So when we try to grasp this ego, it 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 slips away because it, has, it cannot stand without grasping forms. So if we try to grasp, if, if ego tries to grasp itself, it subsides. So when we try to attend only to ourself, ego subsides and we remain in the state of just being as we are. That is why in that sentence in uh, Nana, where Bhagavan uses this term Atmanishtaparan, that is in uh, the paragraph uh, 13, he, what he says is, he, he doesn't, that, that the main clause is, Atmanishta Paranai Iripide Tanne Isanaku Alipadam. That is, means being as Atmanishta Param, one who is firmly established as oneself, alone is giving oneself to God. That is the main clause. But he, he explains what Atmanishta Param is in the, uh, in the uh, adverbial clause in which he says, Anma chintane tabira, vera chintane kalamba vidaku satram idam kodamov. Anma chintane literally means thought of oneself. But in effect, how do we think of ourselves? We attend to ourselves. And in effect, atmanish, atma chintana is another term for uh, what is sometimes called swarupa dhyana or atma vichara. It's self, being self attentive. So if we attend to ourselves keenly enough, if we attend to ourselves so keenly that we give no room to the rising of any other thought, that means we are attending to ourselves to the exclusion of all other things. Because we are attending to ourselves so keenly, there's no room for anything else to enter our awareness. So that state of keen self-attentiveness, that itself is atmanishta, because when we attend to ourselves keenly, we ego subsides and we remain in the state of just being as we actually are. And that is the state of true surrender. So surrender and vichara are one and the same. Uh, vichara and apanishta are one and the same. As he says in uh, Upadesha India, in um, 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 in um, uh, Uh, verse 26, Tanai uh, iritale, being as oneself is knowing oneself. That is, being oneself is sat, knowing oneself is chit. Sat and chit are one and the same thing. We think of awareness and existence as two different things. But if we think about it carefully, there is no... Uh, but, Nothing exists except in our awareness. So even the, the existence of the world, it exists where? Only in our awareness. So there is no such thing as it, it, to, to exist means to be known. Uh, the world doesn't actually exist because it doesn't exist in its own view. It exists only in the view of ego. So it's only a seeming existence. But our own existence, we 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 exist as awareness. Awareness is our real nature. So awareness is uh, our existence and our awareness are one and the same. As he says in a, 
in, in, um, in an earlier verse of, um, uh, of uh, Upadeshundia, in verse um, 23, he says, uh, Unudu unara uh, unuvu verin mayin. Since there is no awareness other than Uludu to know Uludu, Uludu unavahum, Uludu itself is unavu. That is, that, that is what exists is only awareness. To put it in simple English, since since there is no awareness other than what exists, to know what exists, what exists is awareness. And then he, he concludes by saying, unave namai ulam. That means awareness alone exists as we. We are awareness. So we are both uladu and unavu. We are what exists and what is aware of its existence. So being and knowing are not two different things. How to know ourselves? just by being ourselves, being as we actually are. Being as we actually are, tana iritale, that means being without rising as ego. How do we remain without rising as ego? That also he, he's, um, he explains in, um, in Uludu Napadu verse 27, very beautifully. See, if we, if we become familiar with all these works, they, they, we will find all the answers we're looking for are actually given by Bhagavan in these works. In verse, what he says in verse 27, nan udiyada ulanile, nam aduvai ulanile. That means the state in which uh, one exists without I rising is the state in which we exist as that. So what is the state in which we are Brahman? We, we are as we actually are. It is the state in which we don't rise as I. That means the state we don't rise as ego. Then he asks in the next sentence, Nan udikum tanum ade nadamo. That means without or unless we, uh, we uh, investigate or we, is, um, we, we uh, attend to the, the place from which I rises, Nan udia tan irupe sabdu eban how to reach the annihilation of oneself in which I does not rise. So what he implied, this is a rhetorical question. Obviously the meaning of this is the only way to attain our, the, the, the state, to annihilate the ego, the state in which ego doesn't rise, is to investigate the place from which I rises. What is the place from which I rises? Obviously ego rises only from ourself. So investigating the, what he calls nan udicum tanum, the place from which I rises, is our self. So it's only by investigating our self that we can refrain from rising its ego and thereby be as we actually are. Yes. Uh... So and he, he actually, I'll just finish off since I've been explaining. In the last sentence, he says just that. Uh, uh, saramo, that means without attaining that state, that uh, uh, annihilation of oneself, uh, tan adu am uh, tan nileil nipadu eban satru. That means uh, um, without uh, uh, reaching, that means without reaching that annihilation, without attaining that annihilation, achieving that annihilation of ourself, say how to stand in the state of oneself that means how to be as we actually are how to be in that uh, our natural state in which oneself is that so the, the the whole the key to the whole thing the key to being as we actually are is self-attentiveness to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, ego subsides and thereby we remain as we actually are so it is as i said it even to call it a technique, make complicated. Technique, a technique is necessary. Do you need a technique for um, for looking at your computer screen, for, for seeing what's on your computer screen? In order to see what's on your computer screen, you just look at it. There's no technique involved. So in order to see what we actually are, we just need to look at ourselves. We need to attend to ourselves. And the more we attend to ourselves, the more ego subsides, and thereby we remain as we actually are. So knowing ourself is being ourself, and being ourself is knowing ourself. Does that help to clarify at all? A little bit. 
the thing is now. Uh, can I just say one more thing? One more thing. The key to understand all these things can be explained in words, very quite simply. Actually, it's a very simple matter. But to truly understand, the only way to is to practice it. To put, try to put it into practice. If if you want to learn to ride a bicycle, you can read manuals on how to. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, ride a bicycle, you can even study the science of balance and uh, you can read about the physics and everything. But none of these things are going to help you to ride a bicycle. The only way to ride a bicycle, you know, and to ride a bicycle, you've got to balance. Start doing it. You, you wobble, you wobble, you fall off. You get up and wobble, wobble some more. Sooner or later, you get the hang of it. Likewise with self-investigation. We wobble at first. But as we go, uh, and as we uh, accustom ourselves to being self-attentive, our self, uh, our self-attentiveness will become more steady, and will become clearer to us what actually is by one means by self-investigation. Yeah, the thing is now the wording uh, gave an impression to me, kundamadi, and look at carefully those yeah. two wording i thought i have to i can't feel the ego or whatever the life force in within me i can't feel it when i'm put in practice so i was thinking oh i, I have to concentrate more on that something i i, I got a false uh, idea but later when i was discussed with sange i was asking why they say skundamadi, but Atman is the parent stage is even no mind at all. Even I was not clear in the latest explanation. Yes. You were saying Atman is the parent means only attending, our mind is attending only in the Atma. Yes. Even that also absent the, some stage. In my experience, I may be, the experience mean I have seen in YouTube, the people are saying you can uh, uh, see some lights. Even I ask some stage that question. You focus in the forehead. So whatever the people say, and that gives some false idea and we are always singing. So now I am a very junior to this field. So I came to Bhavan path and I, I totally trusting and I want to find out maximum as much as possible. That's what my, I want to clarify what is yeah. here. Yeah. So I was trying and actually thinking, okay, if I concentrate on my ego, then something we will realize our re true nature. No, actually what I, what is happening? I can feel that my life force, what is that called ego? It is there. When that one stage, it is even, I am not thinking at all. So actually my mind is absent, but I'm not staying on that stage forever. It is going, coming back and go, and go to one stage is no um, uh, thoughts. Otherwise I can concentrate on my ego. So that is the one way I can hold it. So that, that is my experience. So I want to clarify. So what is this uh, Kundamadi, sharp mind? So those those are really confusing, confused me. Kundamati, Kundamati literally means a very sharp or focused mind. It means a, a keen power of a, attentiveness. That is, we need to be keenly self-attentive. So yeah. Rather than allowing our attention to be scattered away towards other things, we need to focus our whole attention keenly and sharply, acutely on ourself. That's all it means. Yeah, for me... And Bhagavan also says nunmatiyal. Nunmatiyal means a very subtle intellect. But though he uses the word intellect here, it's not... People generally associate the word intellect with reasoning and everything. But intellect is actually the power of, um, of distinguishing, of distinguishing one thing from another. So we need to... We, we need to distinguish ourselves from all the adjuncts that we now mistake ourselves to be. 
how do we do so by focusing our entire attention just on I? The more we focus on I, the more other things drop off. And the more we focus on I, the more I itself, I in the sense of ego, the more ego subsides. And the more ego subsides, the closer we come to just being as we actually are. Yes, Michael. Now we have, I have got the understanding, basic understanding that neti neti, I am, body is not me, mind is not me, knowledge is not me. Yeah. I, I can understand. So that's then all I preliminary. Can... That's not the vichara. That, that, that is, the, that is the, the, the preparation for vichara. Because we first yeah, that's already, what... if I realize that yeah. or understand yeah. that by my knowledge yeah. as a human being, I can understand that. So then there's no point uh, sitting and meditating, thinking I am not body. But the yeah. only thing I want to concentrate on my ego, the in, in the layman term, I can say um, even uh, life force, something inside keeping me alive. Uh, so even, that is, even, even that is a complicated way of saying it. It is you. You are yes, that. Yes, yes, I, think I, 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 I. I is the simple term. We yeah, all refer I, to ourselves as I. So it's just... Yeah. We have to attend to I. Okay, in this point, I want to ask you to clarify me. To my understanding, the term I abidance to stay with the ego and self abidance is to stay with as pure consciousness. These stages may be fluctuate during our self investigation process when we put in the practice. That is my understanding and belief. It may be wrong. So, I will be grateful if you could explain between these two, the I abidance and self abidance. To my to clarify, what is these two things? There, there is no difference. There is no difference. There are not two things: I and self. I, I when I, I sorry, I, I, I and myself are not two different things. No, it, when it, I it, think I mean it's my ego. I. Self means there is no thoughts. That okay. is my pure okay. consciousness. What is the okay? Um, <laughs> ego is nothing but you. Yeah, but that but is uh, the, 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 the difference. The different. difference between ego and our real nature. Ego is our real nature um, mixed with um, mixed with adjuncts. When we experience us, now you are aware of yourself as I am Saravana Bhavan. That mixed feeling, because you're mixing I with, a, with some adjuncts. Saravana Bhavan is the name of a person, that's adjuncts. That when that I is mixed with adjuncts, it's called ego. But in that ego, what is real in that ego? Saravana Bhavan is just some, is, is a phenomenon that appears and disappears. You're not aware of yourself as Saravana Bhavan when you're asleep, but I remains there. So we need to distinguish ourselves from all these adjuncts. Yes, so, none, none. Yes. So, but essentially, ego is just like the, the rope, sorry, the snake is nothing but a rope. Ego is nothing but Atmaswarupa. It seems to be something different. Because we don't look at it carefully enough, but if you look at the, if you look at the snake carefully enough, you'll see that it was never a snake. It was always only a rope. Likewise, if we look at ego carefully enough, if we look at ourselves carefully enough, we will find that we were never ego. We were always just pure awareness. So there are not two things, ego and uh, Atma Swarupa. It is one thing, but the, the difference is not a difference in substance, it's a difference in appearance. The snake and the rope are one and the same thing. The difference between the snake and the rope is only a difference in appearance. Yeah, when we say I, that means something little out from myself. Because no. that how, how can how can I be something out from yourself? You are the you you alone are I. I am Brahman. Brahman, the I is what you actually are. The problem is not I, the problem is what you have mixed with I. Saravana yep. Bhavan is something out from, uh, out, uh, away from I, but I is just, I is Brahman. 
what is then ahandai anavam ahandai that is the ahandai is ego the ego as i said it is an adjunct mixed uh, uh, self awareness that yes. is it is i mixed with adjuncts so <laughs> when i meditate what i fear i i i at I, I am thinking or i abide with my ego where is my ego yes inside somewhere is there i am not want to concentrate on the right side of the heart or actually it is whole body my whole body is that uh, i no no <laughs> no that whole why, body that is why we do that is why the neti neti is necessary we first need no, to understand i am like, not this body <laughs> you what body is jada you body is not aware of anything it is you who are aware of yourself as i am this body so who is that i who says i am this body who is this that i but is aware of itself as i am this body it's the ego that is ego, ego. Says. so yes if we look at ego carefully enough we will see but ego is nothing but pure awareness then it is there's never was any ego there never was any body or anything there's only pure awareness but in order to see but what we actually are is pure awareness we need to look at ourselves very carefully if we don't look at the snake carefully enough it looks like a snake and it causes fear and all sorts of problems but if we look at it carefully enough we'll see oh it's just a rope then when we see it as a rope the idea that it's a snake goes away the fear goes away all problems are solved so all yes. we have to do is to look at ourselves carefully enough and see what we actually are then all problems are solved yeah when you said that carefully i have to look then i was thinking i have to concentrate more what on my ego but, but it, i don't want to even i just want to only yeah, whenever yeah, 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 even to say concentrate we just have to we just have to I, I keenly self attentive by being keenly self attentive we abide yes so whenever other thoughts are coming immediately i will concentrate on that i yes, maybe yes. ego who, who, but once who they... is aware of all these thoughts i am yes so we turn so, our attention back towards ourselves yes that's all until recently i was thinking is something else we had to kundamadi i had to use the kundamadi so i was really confused kundamadi so, means keen it, in effect it means keen power of attention we have to be we have to keenly focus our attention on ourselves we have to be keenly self attentive when i have started my university there were some westerners came from north india and they taught us the transcendental meditation right and that was actually very impressive for me actually it's make a deep uh, imprint on my life so far and actually it was helping to concentrate most of the time when we are having busy lifestyle i have seen there are some similarity between bhava and path and transcendental meditations principle but there are totally the basic is something different can you compare those things and is there anything you can comment on that transcendental meditation and bhavan path uh, well i i i don't know what i, I from what i I've, i've never um, i never learned transcendental meditation from what i what i understood about it is that it is basically some it's concentration on some sort of mantra or something but i i don't know but and the, the thing the thing is any type of meditation where we can attend to uh, either to ourselves or to something other than ourselves if 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 the um if what we are attending to if what we are meditating on is only ourselves that is atma vichara if it, if we are meditating on anything other than ourselves that is some other type of meditation as bhagavan says in verse 8 of upadesh undia bhagavan distinguish his anya baba from ananya baba ananya baba anya baba means meditating on what is above than ourselves 
that is most types of meditation. Ananya Baba means meditating on what is not other than oneself. What is not other than oneself? Only oneself. So Ananya Baba means uh, self-investigation. It's, uh, it's meditating on oneself alone. So I believe, from what I, uh, from a little I know about it, but though, though the person who started this transcendent, who started popularizing this transcendental meditation, though um, supposedly he came from an Advaita tradition, I, he claimed his guru was one of the Shankaracharyas, so he came from a, a Advaita tradition, but like many Advaitins, the, in the practice, he didn't go, it, it, but what is the correct practice of Advaita? What does Advaita mean? Advaita means not two. So if you're meditating on any object, you've got two things there. You've got a subject and an object. So that is Advaita. The only correct Advaita meditation, non-dual meditation, is to meditate on I. Because then you've only got one thing. I is attending to I. So, uh, I, I don't know from I don't know exactly what he taught in the name of transcendental meditation or what the theoretical I mean on how he the the, 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 the the rational basis for it but as far as the, the way transcendental meditation was um, sold was popularized was marketed was as a technique for concentration, relaxation, all these things. It wasn't really taught as a, as a, as a means of Thank knowing you. our real nature, of, uh, of attaining Brahmanyana. That was not the way it was marketed. So I, 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 as I say, I don't know a lot about it. I can't really say more, I, I, unless you want to tell me something about it and ask any specific I questions. love to, I can say that, <laughs> yes. Actually, oh. what did we say? They gave a mantra, as you said, and then we asked, what is the meaning of mantra? They said nothing, no meaning. The purpose is, the, our thoughts are in the brain having a several waves pattern. In um, medi medically, we can call alpha, beta, gamma, theta waves. So several thoughts bring lots of waves. So what did they say? You do this practice in the morning and evening 20 minutes. Just think, uh, sit comfortably and think about that mantra. One stage you will even don't think about the mantra. That's fine. That is the stage you want to get it into. So there's no meaning for mantra. There's no God. Only thing in Bhava and Path, we have to replace with that mantra with I. If we replace that I in that stage, place and also if we trust our advisor philosophy that is the state and we are not limiting to 20 minutes we are 24 7 we are thinking about that that is a basic thing there actually so the basic difference is that transcendental meditation you're meditating on an object on something other than yourself namely a mantra where it's in self-investigation you're meditating only on yourself not on anything other than yourself yes but yeah, that, only you that, to replace that mantra with I. That's all. <laughs> yes, so, yes. But that's a huge I difference. Really like that. <laughs> that, that is a huge difference because, as Bhagavan explained, the ego rises and is sustained and is nourished by attending to things other than itself. So attending to a mantra is Urupatri, Urupatrudal. It's grasping a form. Yes. So that yeah, is yeah, sustaining yeah. ego. Whereas in, in self-investigation, we are not grasping any form. We are trying to grasp this formless ego. And when we try to grasp it, it slips away because there's no such thing. E ego seems, has anyone ever seen ego? Ego seems to exist so long as we're looking at other things. But when we look at ourselves, we can't find anything <laughs> called ego. I didn't see even you know, your awareness. I, didn't, I never seen both together. As, as Bhagavan says in um, verse 17 of Upadesha India, Manati Nuruve Maravadu Chava Manamenam Ondrile Ondipara. That is, if we, if we investigate 
mind, mind here means ego, but I, I if we investigate mind ke uh, keenly enough without, uh, without, um, without forgetting, that is without allowing our attention to be diverted towards anything else, we will, what will we will find? Manamena Mandrile, there's no such thing as mind at all. Yes. One more question, Sanjay, before then I leave. That can be very easily explained in terms of, uh, if you look at the snake carefully enough, without getting your attention diverted away to anything else, um, Pambu Andrile Undipara, there's no such snake at all. <laughs> it's only a rope. Yes, Michael Ji. What I have talked to some other devotee um, uh, following Bhavan path, even maybe few, not many, uh, they are observing the breath. I did that in uh, Vipassana uh, five years back. And then even some people can even looking at the light. For those people even following the Bhavan path and still they are not having any clarity on that what they are looking, whether observing the breath. Body is not us. That I don't know. Bhagavan's path. <laughs> tell to them. Bhagavan's path is a path of self-attentiveness, not a path of attending to anything else. Yeah, that's what I, it was surprised when I talked to some people, they are still breathe, observing the breath, but they are coming to our Zoom meeting. So mm. I was thinking, uh, still not clear idea some people have got. So that's what I just want to, uh, from your wording, you can tell something for them. <laughs> The breath is, is the, the breath is the prana, but one of the five sheaths. It's one of the grosser. It's it's the second grossest form, of, uh, uh, second grossest of the five sheaths. So attending to prana is not going to uh, enable us to know what we are. If we want to know what we are, we have to attend to ourselves. If you want to make research on prana, attend to prana. If you want to make research on yourself, attend to yourself. Yeah, definitely. This is like a transcendental meditation. One mantra, one uh, prana, yeah, yeah, all sorts yeah. of things. But at least... By, by attending to the uh, breathing, one can calm down the mind. One can reduce the activity of the mind. Not bring it to... A, one can reduce it. And if one goes on long enough, particularly if you, you, tell, you go on from just watching the breath, they're trying to restrain the breath, you can even bring about Manalaya. But that is not, Bhagavan never recommended Manalaya because Manalaya is just a state like sleep. You don't destroy any vasanas in sleep. So yes, Bhagavan I told the story of a, a yogi who was, uh, who was practicing pranayama and was able to go into, um, into uh, Nivikalpa Samadhi, which is just a state of Manalaya, for increasingly long time, and eventually one time, one day when he woke up from his uh, nivikalpa samadhi, he was feeling thirsty. So he asked his disciple to bring water from the Ganga. The Ganga was just nearby, so his disciple went to him, bring water. But before he came back, the yogi had again gone back into his nivikalpa samadhi, and he remained in that nivikalpa samadhi for three hundred years. In the meanwhile, the disciple had died, all the people in the village had died. He was still sitting in the same place. The Ganga even changed course. When he woke up after 300 years, the first thing he asked, he angrily said, where's my water? So Bhagavan said, even the, even the last thought in his mind was the first thought that came up. That means no vasanas were destroyed at all. He spent 300 years basically in sleep, achieving nothing. So yes. this Nivakalpa Samadhi or is, is, is of no use. So you can bring about Nivakalpa Samadhi by various meditation or pranayama techniques, but it's just like uh, sleeping. You're not bringing about the destruction of vasanas. So we, our aim is we need to destroy the vasanas because what are vasanas? Vasanas are those inclinations that draw our mind outwards towards other things. So how do we destroy them? Most effective way to destroy them, Bhagavan says, is to practice self-investigation. Because every time we try to turn our attention back within, we are gradually weakening that inclination to face outwards. And when the, that inclination to face outward is sufficiently weakened, we'll be able to turn our whole attention within, thereby annihilate ego, 
and when the ego is annihilated, all vasanas are annihilated because vasanas are for whom? Only for ego. So Bhagavan's path is, uh, is a complete and perfect path. Yeah, it's very simple. I like to make very it simple. more simple. <laughs> I will come back you, to that you, after. You cannot, make, you cannot make one simpler than one. <laughs> uh, Self-investigation is a state of oneness. It's a state of I attending to I. There cannot be anything simpler than that. So I'll start with my first question to Michael. Now, uh, so let's begin with your latest article. Am I clear, sir? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. So let's begin with your latest article on the blog called Praising or Disparaging Others is Anatma Vichara. It seems some portions of this article has been written with an agonizing heart. Means you were really disturbed by what was going on in your blog. Am I correct? One. And I would love to hear the gist of the article directly from you because the message it contains is extremely important. The message is, uh, it's, a, it's a very long article. So many people may not read it, but, uh, but like many may, many may view this video. So if you can summarize the message there, uh, it will be helpful to me and to others also. Um, yeah, uh, regarding your first question, yes, I, I haven't read most of the comments, but I read a few of them here and there. And there was a lot of personal antagonism and um, a lot of the comments were uh, a display of uh, what Bhagavan would call asubhavasanas. Uh, the minds of those people who were, who were writing those um, antagonistic and um, mean and unkind and disrespectful comments, their mind is under the sway of asubhavasanas. When we look out at the world, we can see a sub of us has displayed in so many ways, but it is painful to see it in the context of what is supposed to be a, a forum dedicated to discussing Bhagavan's teachings. Bhagavan's teachings are all about annihilating ego. Uh, whereas uh, the, 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 when we allow a sub of, when we when we allow our mind to be under the sway of a subhavasanas, we are giving rise to ego. When, um, in the early days, I think when Bhagavan was still in Skandashram, uh, for a while, the, the person who considered himself a manager of, uh, of Skandashram was Paramal Swami, the person who later put court cases to Bhagavan. And the, he was always trying to, um, he, he was becoming more and more egotistical. And at a certain stage, when there was some dispute between him and some devotees, Bhagavan said to him, you're all about I, I, I. I came here to get rid of I. So I it, 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 people who are trying to assert themselves, who are trying to assert I am right, you are wrong, this is all ego. This is the complete opposite of, uh, of uh, what Bhagavan's teachings are all about. Bhagavan's teachings are all about turning within, subsiding, subsiding, subsiding. And um, the people who were commenting on the blog, both those who were attacking and those who were retaliating, it's equally bad to retaliate. If someone attacks you and you retaliate, I mean, I'm talking about verbal. If someone it's totally inappropriate in, a, in the context of Bhagavan's teachings. It looks, it, it is, it's, um, it's very, very uh, distasteful and uh, unpleasant to see such things going on in what, sh when, because there are some people who comment on the blog who are sincerely trying to comment about Bhagavan's teachings, whereas others are allowing their, their, um, their ego to, um, to, to dominate, oh. and that, that is very disturbing. Regarding the message of the, um, of the, the, the essential message of that article, it, it is, Bhagavan's path is about turning within. We, we should be focusing on trying to turn within. The more we turn within, the more ego will subside. 
the more we look outwards, see others, criticize others, um, and and uh, allow our mind to dwell on the, I, I, I say not only disparaging others, even praising others is, is an atma vichara, because in order to praise someone or to disparage someone, you have to first see their good qualities or their bad qualities. Good qualities and bad qualities, and the people whose good qualities and bad qualities they are, are things other than ourselves. We need to, we shouldn't even be looking at our own good and bad qualities. We should be looking at ourselves alone, according to Bhagavan. Of course, when we allow our mind to come outwards, we need to behave in an appropriate manner. We need to behave in a humble, simple, uh, uh, non-egotistical manner. We need to be kind to people. We need to be charitable. The very opposite has been happening in the comments on my blog. And for me, that is very... I find that very, very um, distasteful and um, it's, it's very unpleasant. These, uh, these should have no place at all in a discussion about Bhagavan teachings. It, 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 okay, sometimes we may have different understanding. You and I may understand things differently. We can discuss our understanding, but if I start attacking you, Rather than what what I think are your wrong understanding, that is, uh, then I'm allowing my ego to come into play. That is what's sure. been happening. It's sure. So thank you very much. I think and Bhagavan said, "Banda bele pa." What is our banda bele? Our banda bele is not to come here and criticize other people or to. Our banda bele is to turn within and subside. Yes, sir. So it was a, it was a lovely article. But I finished. it was quite unpleasant for me writing that article because I, yeah. I, I am criticizing people for criticizing people. So it, it, no, it's not. It's, it, but I've not been, I wasn't criticizing individual. I was criticizing idea. The, the, the wrong, yes. wrong behavior and wrong, the, the wrong ideas that lead to such wrong behavior because some people try to yes. justify wrong behavior by saying, oh, everything that I do is according to Prarabdha. That is, yes. that is a, a, um, a complete misinterpretation of Bhagavan's teaching. Yes. Because... Whatever happens to us is according to Prarabdha. Whatever we do, we cannot say it's according to Prarabdha. Because otherwise you can justify doing anything. Yes, I could, I could feel it from the tone of your article that it's come from a very... Uh, from the feeling of hurt inside, there's some something is coming out of you. Yes. So I was also disturbed uh, seeing well, that. It, so I want to it, ask that. It, it is a uh, subhavasanas are disturbing. Mm. So whether we're it, whether it's our own subhavasanas or other people's su uh, subhavasanas we're dealing with, it is yes. painful. Yes, 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 and especially yes. especially in a forum like this, Ramana Maharishi teaches. Yes. It's totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable, I think. That, anyway, that, is what, that is why I told you I was thinking of completely closing down all comments on the blog. But I yes, think but, what, what, but what I, never do that. Never do that. If you do that, uh, we'll be lost. Especially me <laughs> okay. will be lost. Well, I will so, keep it, but I, I'm giving it a few more days. But if, what yes. I plan to do from next week is yes, um, if, any, if anyone brings any comments to my attention, but uh, yes. uh, derogatory. Um, yes. I maybe we'll, we'll start from next week. Anyone who brings okay. any comments. Um, okay. Next week so is first, first of, next week is first of September. So let's okay. take first of September as the starting point. Anyone who okay. brings okay. any derogatory or um, disrespectful comments after the first of September, I will delete them. Yes. That's a that's a good news, sir. That's a good news. But I don't have time to read all the comments because I have so much other work. So I will rely on um, on people to inform me if they think any yes, comments sir. are inappropriate. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. That's a good idea. I believe that's a good idea. So I'll ask my next next question, sir. I'll ask my next question. Yes, yes. Please, please. Yes. So now, in your latest article again. You say something to the effect 
that if we fully surrender our ego god will fully take over our responsibility is it correct sir yes yes so but what remains to be taken taken care of after after the full surrender of ego so so if there is no ego there is no body no mind no world so after the full surrender since there is no body and mind no care is required for god's god side could you explain this okay <laughs> what you say is true but then why bhagwan wrote verse 7 of arunachal navamani malai which was the verse i was talking about yes <laughs> in um because verse seven of uh, arunachal stuti panchakam and the bhagwan who wrote the uh, ramana maharshi wrote arunachal stuti panchakam all exist in our view Oh. if we see ourselves as we actually are oh. then there's no ego and therefore no uh, ramana maharshi no um uh, arunachal stuti panchum nothing bhagavan bhagavan came as a as guru to show us the path so he through arunachal stuti panchum he was teaching us the path of uh, of uh, of self investigation and self surrender so um he, 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 we we need to understand what what he says there that is if we want to give once once we have surrendered ourselves completely god takes over complete control we have no right to question anything uh could he uh in a core kure and do is there any shortcoming is there anything lacking that is mm. in that state of complete surrender where we've handed ourselves over completely to god and he has mm. taken charge of us mm. there's no ego left to uh, question anything to complain about any um any lack of defect any 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 lack of or or defects mm. that is the that is the what bhagavan is expressing there mm-hmm. okay so, sir we 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 shouldn't take it literally but uh, um but uh, i i i mean we 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 shouldn't say oh but if he goes not there then how can anyone sing uh how can everyone sing you've taken me as your own the very day you took me as your own we have to understand the context in which it's said the spirit with which it's said yes out the state in which god takes complete control of us it's a state in which there is no ego no world nothing that's why it's, he's got complete control of everything but this is written as, as a devotee by one wrote this showing us how, what is the path of devotion but one is teaching us we shouldn't have we shouldn't feel we should if we surrender ourselves completely he will take over charge then there's no one left to, say uh to uh, complain about any kure any lacking or any defect or anything we shouldn't think of these things at all we should think only of him got it got it sir got it sir thank you i last one more question now ego needs to sleep because of its ceaseless activities and thoughts yeah it needs to rest after all its hard work but since the gyani is not since the gyani does not act in any way by body mind and speech they should not logically need any sleep in the normal sense of the term we know it what do you what do you have to say about it sir the gyani is perpetually asleep to the world and perpetually awake to what is real so it is only in our view that the gyani is a person and therefore seems to have three states waking dream and sleep in the view of the gyani there is only the one state of wakeful sleep that is the state of wakeful sleep is the state in which we, we are awake to our real nature what is real and asleep to everything that is unreal so one question on this is if our ego starts to if our ego starts to subside and a vishaya vasana starts weakening will our sleep pattern also change will we will we sleep less not about gyani i am not asking about a gyani now i am asking about a normal sadhaka 
are you asking about is this a question about yourself or about something about, about myself? myself? About about myself because your, because I your, mean, yourself is beyond sleep. Sleep, waking, dream, and sleep are states that come and go. They are things other than yourself. Mm -hmm. So why should you be concerned about patterns of sleep? Mm -hmm. If you're interested to know yourself, let sleep pattern change or let it not change. What does it matter to you? You are mm -hmm. only because, interested to know yourself. Because of, of late, of late, I find slightly hard to sleep. Anyway, that's not a thing now. It, all these things. All these things are according to prarabdha. The amount of, yes. of, of waking time, dream time, and sleep time is all determined by prarabdha. Let prarabdha take its course. It's no concern of yours. Mm -hmm. Your only concern should be to know who am I. Mm -hmm. I is that which is beyond waking, dream, and sleep. Mm. But I is that which exists, whether I... I exist in waking, I exist in dream, I exist in sleep. What is that I that is constant throughout all these states? Okay. Michael, your mouth is not very clear sometimes. Uh, need to adjust your camera, please. Okay, I don't know what I can do to adjust. Oh, you mean I... I... Uh, mostly, uh, okay. now, good. Now that's okay. correct. Well, then I will... No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Sarah, I'll ask, I'll ask a last question, no, then you take over in the next session. Uh, oh, in this, in this, in this, my, I've got three questions, but I'll ask one and leave it to you now. Yes. So, one more. Now, Bhagwan says, action obstructs liberation. But you have so much discussions on the video with your uh, uh, discussions and all these articles, emails, comments. How do you view all these actions? <laughs> Are they not obstructing your liberation from the from one perspective, even though these are keeping keeping your focus on Bhagavad's teachings? If you have if you have more and more liking to engage in such acts, is it not negatively impacting you in some sense? Because if it is your likes and dislikes, if it is if you like to do all these things, yes. then it is it must be negatively impacting you spiritually also. This yes. is my this is my assumption. I'm not uh, this thing. So are these discussions a result, a result of a satvasana or a subhavasana or a, or a result of both or what? All these discussions we are doing, is it satvasana, subhavasana or what? Um, we, cannot say, we cannot say each action we do, to what extent it is driven by prarabdha, to what extent it is driven by our vasanas. <clears throat> we need not... Bhagavan has said, why should we forever be thinking? Why should we be always thinking it's necessary to do like this, it's necessary to do like that? The actions that we <coughs> the actions that we are destined to do, we will be made to do. Um, but at the same time as we are doing actions that we are destined to do, we are also doing actions driven by our vasanas. We cannot distinguish them. We cannot make out which, to what extent any action is driven by our prarabdha or by our vasanas. We need not try and distinguish because again, we, that's attending to something other than ourselves. What we need to try to do is to attend more and more to ourselves. By attending more and more to ourselves, we are curbing our vasanas, our vishaya vasanas, and the more we curb our vishaya vasanas, the less they will be driving us to do action. Um, I am just an ordinary spiritual aspirant. So of course, I still have vasanas. I'm still acting under the sway of my vasanas. I do not deny that. Um, there is a, always battle going on. There, I enjoy talking about Bhagavan's teaching. And I think talking about Bhagavan's teachings or uh, discussing about writing about Bhagavan's teachings, this is a relatively harmless action. But it's keeping our mind dwelling on his teachings and it's encouraging us to turn back within and follow his teachings. But that liking to do so, I cannot deny because I love his teachings. Um, whether I 
whether I should, I shouldn't be thinking about whether I should do this or I shouldn't do that. I should be trying to turn my attention within. But the more I turn my attention within, the more uh, ego will subside and the less I will be engaging in agamya. Um, obviously, I, because I still have persons, I'm still engaging in agamya. Um, but the, the battle that is to be fought is to be fought within ourselves, not outside. So the more we turn within and thereby surrender ourselves, the closer we are getting to our goal. Let the outward life go on as it is destined to go on. And uh, uh, so long as we allow our mind, attention to come outwards, our vasanas will be interfering and driving us to do things. So long as we're engaged in action, we should try as far as possible uh, to engage in suba, to, to, uh, the, the, the actions of our mind, speech, and body to the greatest extent possible to be suba. To be, uh, we should avoid the suba action. Um, but ultimately, we have to avoid all action. We do so by the practice of self-investigation and self-surrender. We, we cannot totally avoid activities. Whatever activities the body and mind are to do, they will be made to do according to prarabdha. And so long as we're allowing our attention to go outwards, our vasanas will also be playing their, their part in making us do agamya. So what do we have to do? We have to try more and more to turn our attention within. But this is a, a gradual process. I am not by any means perfect. My, my vasanas are playing their role. I don't deny that. Um, but slowly, 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 by Bhagavan's grace, I'm, I'm trying little by little to turn my attention within. That's all we can do. Let's not concern ourselves for about whether these actions are prarabdha or whether they're agamya or whether it's it's a su, a suba or suba. Obviously, we have to avoid the, what is a suba as much as possible. We, if we cannot give up action altogether, at least let our action be driven by suba vasanas rather than a suba vasanas. The liking to talk about Bhagavan's teaching, relatively speaking, are suba vasanas. But even those vasanas have to be given up. I agree. I agree. But they are also they are also satvasana. Like no. you talk about Bhagavan's teaching, they're also they can be called as the satvasana also. No, satvasana means liking just to be, not to rise at all. So they are still vish talking is a is an activity. And when we words and other people to whom we're talking, it's all vishaya, aren't they? So they, these are all the play of Vishaya Vasanas, but they are, they are, relatively speaking, they are Subha Vishaya Vasanas rather than a Subha Vishaya Vasanas. But ultimately, all, um, uh, all Vishaya Vasanas are a Subha because they're taking us away from ourselves. So ultimately, it's only Satvasana is the only truly Subha, perfectly Subha Vasana. Whereas sattvasa means like the inclination just to be as we are, not to rise as ego at all. The, yes, sir. The more, we, the more we, we, we investigate ourselves, the weaker our vishaya vasanas become. The weaker our vishaya vasanas become, the more our vasanas will tend to be shubha. They'll, they'll, tend, they'll tend to be more humble, kind, compassionate, caring. Because when our Vishaya Vasanas are very strong, we, they tend to make us more wrapped up in ourselves. We tend to be more egotistical, more selfish, and so on. So by weakening our Vishaya Vasanas, we are, we are getting rid of the uh, Subha Vasanas. And those Vasanas that remain are then relatively Subha. But the, the deeper we go in the path of self-investigation, the more even those subhavasanas will drop off. And eventually what will remain is only satvasana. So there are a few questions. One, first one, yep, it is also brought when we have discussion. Individual thoughts are arising from one common source or individual source. That is from one ego or separate egos or from 
our pure consciousness. If it is from one source, like a one ego only or pure consciousness, then everyone can read others' mind. Can you please comment on that? <laughs> um, oh, the first thought is ego. And as Bhagavan said, ego is the root of all other thoughts. So all other thoughts arise from ego. Ego arises from pure awareness, pure consciousness. Um, it, when we look outwards, we see many people. We assume all those people, because we as ego take ourselves to be a person, we take every other person to be an ego. So when we are dreaming, we see many people. We think all those people are seeing the world just as I am, as I am. So they are, those other people seem to be egos just like us. But when we wake up, we recognize that those people were just a figment of our imagination. But the one who was perceiving the dream was only ourselves, the dreamer. Now, according to Bhagavan, our present state is just a dream. If our present state is just a dream, there is only one dreamer. That dr the dreamer, the one who is seeing the dream is a dreamer. That is ego. That is one ego. So everything else in, exists only in the view of that one, of, of the dreamer. The whole dream exists only in the view of the dreamer. If we are ready to accept that, then um, that's, a much, that's the simplest explanation. But there are some pe many, many people are uh, unwilling to accept that this is just a dream, and that there are all the other, all the but there is only one ego. But we are the only ego. So then you there are different levels of explanation are given. Even within a Dvaita, most uh, most Dvaita explanations are based upon the assumption that there are many egos. And analogies are given, like there's one sun. That's a pure awareness but it's reflected in many pots of water. The reflections of a, of a nana jiva, the many jivas. Um, so according to the maturity of the aspirant, different levels of teachings are given. Bhagavan, uh, Bhagavan's teachings, the core of Bhagavan's teachings are Eka Jiva Vada, but there's only one jiva. But often, when he gave explanations, he explained as if there are many jivas, because that was suited to the, uh, to the level of maturity, of understanding of the people, of the individuals he was uh, talking to. So uh, in different contexts, different levels of explanation are appropriate. Simplest, as I say, is Eka Jiva Vada, but there's only one, this whole Everything that we're experiencing is just a dream. We, we who are seeing this dream, we are the one ego. We are the dreamer. We are the one who... So everything... So as the one ego, everything else that we see is just our own thoughts. What we see in a dream is just our own thoughts. Um, so um, all perceptions are just thoughts. So where do all these thoughts come from? They come from us, the, the dreamer. All, all, everything that is dreamed comes from the dreamer. Where does the dreamer come from? The dreamer comes from pure awareness. The dreamer is ego. Does that adequately answer your question? Yeah, that last part, what I am saying, if there is one source creating everything, if Sanjay thinking, I should be able to um, understand. When you say one source creating everything, source means that from which everything comes. But what creates everything is ego, according to Bhagavan, according to, to the teaching of Bhagavan. If we're ready to accept Bhagavan's teaching, what creates everything is ego. Mm -hmm. So ego, in this, you could say ego is the source of all this, but uh, uh, to avoid confusion, it's easier to, uh, Bhagavan generally describes ego as a root. Root can also be taken as source, but uh, the, the actual, the, the original base from which everything comes is pure awareness. From pure awareness, ego seems to have risen. 
from ego, everything else sprouts. Okay, that is Anatma Visarai, the beginning I said. But one more thing. Is there any starting point or beginning to ego? Or it is beginningless? First, um, Bhagavan will say, that's the wrong question you asked. First, find out if there is an ego. <laughs> Whether ego exists or not is, the, is what we are trying to find out when we're in self-investigation. If we investigate ego, we will find that there, there never was any such thing. Is there any starting point for the, uh, for the snake? If you look at it carefully enough, you'll see there never was any snake. So if there never was any snake, there never was any starting point. So long as there seems to be a snake, we have to assume, okay, well, that snake must have been born. So where did it come from? It came from an egg. Where did that egg come from? It came from its mother. And where did that mother come from? She came from an egg and you, <laughs> there's, no, there's no end to it. Okay, I will put it in a different way. In the jiva, we are having that sanchida karma, we are came with the prarapta karma, so that is carried through the jiva. Yes. When did this jiva start? Any <laughs> starting point or there's no... Because we are some okay, uh, government, okay. I'll let the... Um, who, who, is, who is causing you... Pro what is your problem now? You have, you have faced so many problems. All these problems, the cause of all these problems is your rising as jiva. Yeah. So rather than being interested in the beginning of your jiva, of this jiva, why don't you take more interest in how to bring this jiva to an end? That we are bring... trying, but as a part of the discussion, I, yeah. we were, I okay. put some riddle for okay. Sanjay. Okay. okay, if there is a jiva, then you can look for its beginning. But first, be sh first find out whether there is actually a jiva. That's what Bhagavan says. Rather than trying to investigate what it was in the past or what it will be in the future, what is it now? Does it actually exist even now? So, okay, Michaelji. The other question I, I want uh, to ask. When, we, when, we, when you're dreaming, can you find the beginning, the point where your dream began? It seems to you the dream was beginning, but they had no beginning, but it's, you've always, I mean, you, you, it, it's just like, we, we don't know, we don't know our birth. All our memory goes back to a certain point and then it fades out. So we cannot remember yeah, that's our what birth. I was thinking, there's no beginning for Jiva, but we can end it. It, with it, the... is, it is sometimes said, in in the uh, in the uh, sastras, but Maya has no beginning but does have an end. Why yes. it has no beginning? Because you can't you can never find the beginning of Maya. You, just like you can never find the you 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 can search, however hard you search in your memory, you won't be able to remember your birth. However hard you try to find the beginning of a dream, you can't your memory can't go back that far. So likewise we can never find the beginning of Maya. Because Maya has and never actually begun. Our, our if, discussion we, is if, if we investigate ourselves, we can bring Maya to an end. But if we realize uh, real nature, will that be the end? Or we will, again, we will come as an no, ego? No, no. <laughs> so that's the question also we real, have put. Real, realizing our real nature, when, when we... That's got the beginning, no end. When, when, we, when, we, when we investigate ourselves and find out what we actually are, we will find that we have never risen as ego. For our real nature, there never was any birth. There never was any death. There were, was, never was a beginning or an end. Our real nature, as Bhagavan says, is anadi, beginningless, ananta, endless or limitless, uh, infinite, akanda, unbroken, ananda. So in our real nature, there never was any ego, any beginning of ego or end of ego or interruption by ego. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. One more question, then I will leave to Sanjay. Uh, about the guru. The guru, even you said in some teaching, teaching, t 
teacher is a guru and also is there any one guru for one um, uh, disciple or the, we, uh, like a god appears in different form and uh, different uh, form and time like uh, guru also can appear some stage different in different form in in the 12th verse, uh, 12th paragraph of uh, Nana, Bhagavan begins by saying, Kadavalum guruvum unmail verala. God and Guru are not different. So, God may appear in many different forms, but God is one. If you accept God is one, Guru is one. Yeah, but guru, he, guru, guru also guru, can appear in different forms. Guru can appear in different forms, yes, but Guru is not a form, but as Bhagavan often said, I am not this body. So, but so long as we mistake ourselves to be a body, Guru also, so long as we mistake ourselves to be a person, Guru also seems to be a person. So we have to revere the, the name and form of the Guru, even though Guru is not that name and form. Guru is that which has appeared in that name and form. Yes. So gu Guru is our own real nature, has appeared outwardly in the form of Bhagavan to tell us to turn within and know ourselves. Okay, uh, Sanjay, you more time. Is always I one. Know. Forms may be different, but Guru is one. Yeah. And Guru is not a form. So can anxiety, stress, mental worries be also part of our prarabdha in some cases. I'll repeat, can our anxiety, stress, mental worries be also part of our prarabdha in some cases? They are usually part of our will, but in certain situations, these anxieties, stress, etc., etc., could be the basis of certain actions which may which may do, which we may do according, which may uh, which we will do according to our this thing, prarabdha karma. Means these stress may uh, drive us to do certain actions which are according to our destiny. So is this stress and the uh, tension and the anxiety can some cases, can they, can they be also part of our destiny? I'm saying this. We cannot distinguish what is destiny and what is um... And, and what that is what is as far as our actions are concerned some actions are prarabdha, are driven by according to prarabdha some actions are driven according to our will and they are agamya many actions are driven by both whatever happens to us whatever we experience is according to prarabdha um, in the case of stress and anxiety the things that cause the stress and anxiety may be according to uh, may be according to prarabdha. The stress and how we respond to those, but it, it, these things are so um, are so closely interwoven that we can't clearly distinguish to what extent prarabdha is playing a role and to what extent our will is playing a role. Because our, our will is constantly interacting with prarabdha. So in the case of the, 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 the circumstances that cause us to have stress and anxiety, they are definitely according to prarabdha. The, the fact that they, they, they cause us anxiety only to the extent that we allow our attention to dwell on them. So both are playing a role there. Both are playing a role there. Yeah. So, so, so long as we allow our attention to go outwards, prarabdha and uh, our vasanas are both uh, playing their roles. So, our mental so condition. Our aim is our aim is to try to curb our vasanas as much as possible by turning within. The more we turn within, the the less we will be interacting with the prarabdha. The prarabdha will take its course but we will be less effective by it. 
So we don't have to analyze too deeply what is Parabdha, what is, in fact, attending to what is Parabdha, what is Agamya, that is an Atma Vichaya. We're attending to something no. other than ourselves. Our aim should be just to attend to ourselves. But as far, so as, as far as understanding is concerned, we need to understand whatever happens to us, whatever experiences come to us, they are according to prarabdha. But we then, but our vasanas then interact with those, and that's what uh, uh, we, we can't uh, then clearly distinguish uh, to what extent the prarabdha is playing a role, to what extent our uh, uh, vasanas are playing a role. But that we, we, we need not try and dis, uh, uh, distinguish that. What we need to do is to try to curb our vasanas more and more by turning within. Thank you, sir. Sara, if you have got time, you can ask now. If you have got more questions, uh, you have more questions. One thing, when we have discussed, we have we were we thought of clear, clarifying with Michael G. What I have written here: What is the importance of memorizing the numbers and exact wording and correct spelling of the teaching, like Nanjar or Ulladu Nartadu, and the rest of the teaching? In my view. Considering the real nature is beyond the time and space, do we need to give importance to man-made language, except the usage as a communication tool? Um, we, you, there, there's no use in memorizing numbers. Um, there is even merely memorizing the words is not sufficient. Bhagavan's words convey meaning. It's the meaning we need to imbibe. A lot of Bhagavan, a lot of Bhagavan wrote a lot of, well, not a huge amount, but Bhagavan, a lot of Bhagavan's core teachings were written by him in poetry. One of the reasons why sages write poetry is it's easy to memorize. There is a benefit in remembering what Bhagavan has said, but merely remembering what he said is not sufficient. We, we're not to repeat what Bhagavan said like a parrot. We need to imbibe the meaning of it. But because it's, it's written in poetry, it makes it easy to remember. So we don't have to be carrying, for example, if you know Uludu Napdu by heart, you don't have to be carrying a book around with you. Whatever you are doing, you can be remembering the verses and or you don't have to necessarily remember the whole thing. Certain key verses, certain key teachings of Bhagavan, the teachings that, are, that touch your heart most, if you remember those verses, they will constantly be coming back to you and guiding you through life. So it is good to remember Bhagavan's teachings. And, and if, 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 because you're, you're, you're fortunate, you're a Tamilian, so you can read Bhagavan's teachings in the original. So to remember the, the actual words Bhagavan has said, that his words have their own power. So it is good to remember them, but, but not just like a parrot, uh, uh, repeating like a parrot. We have, to, we have to think deeply about the meaning, the import of these words. What, what is the implications of what Bhagavan has said? Yeah, that is an important but, thing. Thank but, you but, very but, much. But, for example, I quoted earlier, verse 25 of Urudunapdu. Urupatri undam, urupatri nekkam, urupatri undu mutyaongam. Grasping form it comes into existence, grasping form, it stands, grasping form, grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes greatly. Yes, so understanding this nature of ego, so if we remember that verse, and we often think about that verse, that constantly reminding us, what is the nature of ego? Ego rises by grasping other things. It subsides by grasping itself. Ego is not any form. Ego is a formless phantom. Though it identifies itself, though it cannot exist without identifying itself with form, it itself has no form of its own. It's also a phantom. A phantom has no substance. It's got no substance of its own. Because the form it borrows from the body, the substance it borrows from pure awareness. That's why Bhagavan said it's chit jada granti. A knot. If you've got two pieces of string and they're knotted together, the knot is not either piece of string. Suppose you've got a, 
a, a red string and a blue string and you knock them together. They're t bundled they're in a tightly uh, formed knot. The knot is neither the green, the red string, nor the blue string. It is the entanglement formed by the two of them. So if you separate the blue string and the red string, knot has gone. So that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to separate the pure awareness from uh, uh, from all view parties or from from the forms that we mistake to be ourselves. That is how the the knot is severed. Yeah. By disentangling awareness from phenomena. And how do we do that? So long as we hold on to phenomena, we, they, they're entangled. But we are awareness. So we have to separate ourselves from phenomena. That means we attend only to ourselves because we are not a phenomenon. We're not a form. We attend only to ourselves, the forms will drop off. So it's, the, the words of, the, of that verse are important, but they're important, but they're important because of the import, because of the implication, because of the... The, the, what, what the, the inferences we have to draw from that. But many of Bhagavan's verses, they are written in the form of sutras. That is, they're, they're aphoristic in style. But it's, that is because we have to think deeply about them and to, to draw, to understand the implications of what he says. So we shouldn't, dis he, he, the words of his teachings are important, but not, they're important not as words, but for what they convey. Yes, implication. <clears throat> yeah, the, 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 words, the words are like messengers. The, the messenger isn't important. But what the message is that they convey, but, I mean, we, we respect the messenger because they convey, the messenger is conveying a message. But what is important is not the messenger, but the message. So yes. Bhagavan's, one, Bhagavan's words are important insofar as they convey a message, the import. The, what is the import of it? So uh, I wanted to know what exactly is this tatwa? In Naniyar it is said that we should reject all the tatwas. I don't know the exact words, but I was... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in, in, yeah, their tattvas is referring to, according to Bhagavan, Bhagavan says in, um, in Aksharam Lai, um, I think verse 42, 43, around there, he says, Tane, Tane, Tattvam. That is, oneself alone is tattva. Tattva, literally, tat means that. Or it, tattva means itness. It, it, tattva implies what actually exists. So according to Bhagavan, what the only real tattva is ourself. But in other uh, systems of philosophy, other than Advaita, there were many tattvas. Um, in Sankhya and all these other different systems of philosophy, there were many. There were many tattvas. Um, so it is those uh, multiple tattvas that Bhagavan is referring to. Uh, what, they, what Bhagavan implies when he says that, he, he gives the analogy of the, the barbers, the, the, the rubbish in the barber shop, the hair on the floor in the barber shop. It's all, we are not to analyze it, we are to sweep it up and throw it away. So all tattvas, other than I, are to be rejected. The only real tattva is is ourself. What is actually real is only ourself. All the other things are just seeming seemingly real. So they are not real tattvas, they are seeming tattvas. Those seeming tattvas are to be uh, discarded, not analyzed. So there's no no need to know from which Buddha this came or from. I mean, in Sankhya and other systems of philosophy, they have an elaborate cosmology. How f there's Purusha and there's Prakriti, and from Prakriti arose this and this, and how they interact, and it's all very complicated. Uh, that's good for intelligent people, but for dull heads like us, 
let's stick to Bhagavan's teachings, simple teachings. Last question from me, sir. What is the mystery of all your videos? They keep on coming like the like the river Ganga, one after the other. Another means uh, where does it all originate from? So so many videos, so many. It's it's all wonderful, but it's all it, it's too mysterious. You see, so this, this is going to be a video. So where is this coming from? From your questions. As Bhagavan said, the, the answers come from the same source as the questions. If this is all your dream, where are your questions coming from? They're coming from you, the dreamer. And where are these answers coming from? They're coming from you, the dreamer. So, what should you understand from this? What you need to know, everything is there in the dreamer. Know the dreamer and you know everything. So know yourself and you'll know everything. If you know the dreamer, you'll find you never were a dreamer. You were always just pure awareness. Ultimately, that's where everything comes from and where everything must return. But nothing arises from pure awareness independently. What The only thing that arises from pure awareness is the dreamer. The dreamer arises from dreamer. So... From pure awareness, ego rises. All phenomena arise from ego. So go back to the go go back the way you came. The way you came is through ego. Go back through ego back to your source. So you mean to say that I am projecting all your videos? It's my projection. It's it, it's my it's the ego's projection. If this is your dream, whose else projection could it be? So the credit does not go to. So if, the you're ready, does not go if you're ready to accept Bhagavan's teaching that this is just a dream, then who is seeing this dream? I am. So who is this I? This I is the dreamer. We investigate this I. We will find that I is actually not a dreamer. I is just pure awareness. There never was any dreamer. There never was any dream. So, so no credit goes dream, to my dream. This dream is not projected by Sanjay. It is not projected by Michael. It is not projected by Saravana Bhavan. It is not projected by any person. These people are all part of the dream. But I who sees all these things, that is the projector. The perceiver is the projector. So Michael has got nothing to do with these videos. It's all my, it's all my projection. Uh, sorry, what was that? You see, Michael has got nothing to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 Michael, is part of the, Michael is part of the projection. Yes. As is Sanjay. As is Saravana as, um, as is As is Saravana Bhavan. I, the I who is seeing all this, that is the one ego. So who is that I? That is what we need to investigate. Thank you, sir. What we so, sorry, experience as I, that is the ego, that is dreamer. Thank you very much, uh, Makhilji, for <laughs> your precious, uh, time and uh, the knowledge we have get from you. You're, you're, you not, getting, you're not getting any knowledge from me. All the knowledge is coming from, from within you. Because if, if Michael... Michael is part of your dream. So the, Michael has come from within you. So if you want to find out the source from which you're getting all this knowledge, you have to look within yourself. You that is the most important point of uh, uh, Bhavan teaching. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. That's Nothing comes summary. from outside. All comes from within. So we have to look within to find the source of all knowledge. And when we find that source of all knowledge, that is the real nature, that is Bhagavan. That is Bhagavan Swarupa. And Bhagavan Swarupa happens to be our Swarupa, because there is only one Swarupa.